serve the Lord in fear and with trembling bow before him. Good evening and a very warm welcome to Queen's for this service of Choral Evensong, whether you are joining us here in chapel or via the live stream. This evening we are delighted to be joined by our guest preacher, the Reverend Dr. Charlie Bell. Charlie is a priest and a psychiatrist. He is assistant professor at Girton College, Cambridge, and a registrar in forensic psychiatry in South London, where he also ministers as a priest. He has published in both medicine and theology, and his sermon this evening is titled Things as They Are, Flesh, Doctrine and Medical Science. So thank you for joining us, Charlie. All that you will need for tonight's service, you can find on the laminated card in front of you, and you will also need a green hymnal. During Lent, which starts this week, we refrain from singing or saying Alleluia, and so I fear I might have gone overboard this week as a last hurrah. So our first hymn is number 478, Ye Watchers and Ye Holy Ones.
Beloved, we are come together in the presence of Almighty God and of the whole company of heaven to offer unto him through our Lord Jesus Christ our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to make confession of our sins, to pray as well for others as for ourselves, that we may know more truly the greatness of God's love and show forth in our lives the fruits of his grace, and to ask on behalf of all such things as their well-being doth require. Wherefore, let us kneel in silence and remember God's presence with us now. O God, our Father, we have sinned against thee in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved thee with all our heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. Have mercy upon us, we beseech thee. Cleanse us from our sins and help us to overcome our faults. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. May the almighty and merciful Lord grant unto you pardon and remission of all your sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food for forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go. Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram, and you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, of Abel Mehola, as prophet in your place. Here ends the first lesson.
The second lesson is written in the second letter of Peter. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honour and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by human will. But men and women, moved by the Holy Spirit, sp spoke from God. Here ends the second lesson.
I believe in God, the Father of the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and dead and buried. He descended into the The third day he rose again from the earth. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand. From there he shall come to the spirit and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Lord.
Our anthem this evening is from Hubert Parry's Songs of Farewell, There is an Old Belief, a setting of a poem by John Gibson Lockhart.
Well, thank you very much indeed for the invitation this evening to preach at such an esteemed place. And thank you also for choosing such a glorious set of pieces, Parry and Rachmaninoff in the same service, with a bit of the Archbishop's least favourite composer, Herbert Howells, dropped in. Thank you. My sister is not someone who suffers fools gladly. When I went forward for ordination as a priest in the Church of England, she fixed me with a stare, which usually means only one thing, and with a furrowed brow, asked me, what on earth do you want to do that for? Now, several years on, I admit, I think she may have been on to something. But at the time, it wasn't the working eight days a week or the endless wranglings of the church on bedroom politics that was her issue, but something much more simple and yet piercingly relevant to any of us who profess the Christian faith. What on earth do you want to do that for, she asked, with all that make-believe? Reference, perhaps, to those cleverly designed myths that our second reading spoke about. You're a doctor, brother, she said. You can't possibly believe all that rubbish. As I said, she doesn't suffer fools. Yet I think there is something profoundly important about that question. Profoundly important for those of us who profess to be Christians, particularly Christian ministers. Profoundly important for the church as an institution. Profoundly important even for wider society, not least one that has an established church. What on earth do we think we're doing? When I was at university for the first time, at the other place, the other Queen's College, in fact, I remember walking to a human dissection session or something equally unwelcome first thing on a Monday morning and being met by a huge poster that proudly proclaimed, come to St Andrew's Church for our talk, proof why the resurrection definitely underlined, happened. I will admit to being taken aback somewhat. I was at the time a kind of evensong Christian. I liked to turn up mostly to hear our like your wonderful choir, to have a glass or five of sherry afterwards, and to have permission to procrastinate. Yet I had been exposed to the Christian faith throughout my whole life, and I will admit that it was the first time I had even thought that there might be proof of the resurrection, let alone heard anyone suggest it might be the case. I was intrigued. So imagining I was about to discover something quite remarkable, I turned up. Unfortunately, I was also rather disappointed. Whilst the speaker was seriously engaging and talked a good story, proof, at least proof as any scientist, even dare I say a medic, might accept, there was none. I came away absolutely convinced that whilst this posh and perky chap really did believe in the resurrection, having spent a few minutes talking to him afterwards, I was pretty sure he believed a few rather more worrying things as well, I had been rather missold. Now, if that had been a one-off, then I might have just forgotten about it and moved on. But in recent years, as fewer and fewer people seem remotely interested in Christianity and its truth claims, and as the church becomes more and more anxious about its own future, we seem once again to be determined to prove ourselves as someone worth listening to. Sometimes it seems to me that we get it about right. This week, tackling hateful anti-asylum seeker rhetoric, advocating for the poorest in society, and so on. Yet at other times, we seem to get it wrong. We seem so determined to prove our relevance that we lose our distinctiveness. Or we become so determined to prove our distinctiveness that we lose our ability to talk to people. 
And when we make claims just like the alleged and clearly absurd proof for the resurrection, we do so in a way that runs the risk of our being exposed to ridicule and which fails to take the world as it is seriously, where our mode of engagement is so far off the mark that we are simply unable to add anything interesting, coherent or remotely useful to wider public conversation. Now, you might ask, what has any of that got to do with bodies and flesh? Have I missold you a sermon too? Yet right at the heart of the church's message, right at the heart of what it is that the church does and is all about, our human bodies is flesh and blood. There may be indeed much for us to say about the next world, but there's much for us to say about this world too, about war and about peace, about poverty and wealth, about so much else. But all of this springs from our fundamental belief that God cares about us as we are, as human beings, that is, as body, soul, and spirit. Indeed, while some might have you believe otherwise, the Christian faith is not actually about a book, but about a person, Jesus Christ, a human person, fully divine, yet fully human. In our worship, perhaps, we spend more time and energy reflecting on the first of those truths, Jesus is being fully divine, and less on the second, Jesus is being fully human. Yet both are held to be true and essential for our faith. And one of the, the scandalous things about our faith is that that very Jesus Christ had a human body, and it wasn't any different to ours in any more of a way than mine is different to any of yours. On Jesus' death, we were all called to somehow form, in a mystical way, Jesus' body on earth. But that doesn't mean that somehow his being flesh and blood, in a particular time and in a particular place, no longer matters. The Christian faith is, then, one that deals in humankind, that deals with humans that are real and concrete and live and breathe and die as full human persons with everything that that entails. The problem is that as Christians, we far too often end up creating a faith that talks about the world as we wish it might be rather than as it actually is. And rather than that allowing us to say more, it condemns us to saying less. Rather than us talking about real humans in all their glorious and God-given diversity, diversity from which we can learn, we end up talking about Photoshop humanity and a humanity that reflects less rather than more of the life of God who became human. Ideas of bodily perfection are not solely the property of the secular world, and our own pernicious version of body shaming does not stop with allusion to outward appearances. We've seen this time and time again in our history. Contorted and twisted references to Christ's maleness have been used to silence those who are not male. Similar contortions have blighted the history of the church with racism, which we're only now eventually beginning to engage with, let alone properly address. We continue, both in our public and in our private pronouncements, to speak of disabled people in ways that ultimately deny their dignity. And in the contemporary church, God help it, there remain far too many who continue to wish away queer people. It means that we have Christians advocating for so-called conversion therapy and speaking as a psychiatrist, 
I can tell you that it is neither of those things. And we, and we have people arguing for it because of a failure to believe that God could possibly have created real humanity in all its extraordinary wideness and givenness and variety and holiness. If only, if only, everyone was more like us. Then they'd be more like Jesus. If only everyone behaved in a way that we can get our heads around. And believe me, as a forensic psychiatrist, they don't. If only people's human bodily experiences and realities would fit within our own narrow bounds, then they'd be holier and more beloved. If only, if only, if only. Yet, my friends, placing an if only as a stumbling block in the path of Christ is not only foolish, but dangerous. If our doctrines are based on if-onlys, then they are bound to fail, because they're not talking about anything at all. And if we build our church on those if-onlys too, then it will sink into the sea. If we justify our willingness to look down on others by believing the lies that we tell ourselves about the world, then we are not preaching Christ's gospel but our own. We are imprisoning ourselves within our own minds. If we then fail to embrace our whole selves and the selves of others as integrated, real, full human persons, then how can the church possibly have anything to say to anyone about anything? And in a world of cynicism, and a world so often driven by a denial of personhood, and of sacrosanct human dignity, I would argue the church does still have something to say. But it's only through reclaiming the real that we can ever hope to retain, or frankly, regain, the credibility that we desperately seek. And as we look towards the season of Lent, whether we're Christian or not, one way we might learn to recapture the real is to simply learn to pay attention. For that is what the church is called to do. To pay attention to our doctrines, sure, but to pay attention more widely too. Rather than seek to prove those things only known through faith, we're called to offer a vision of the world in which human beings, as human beings, matter to the source of creation. In other words, We're called to listen before we speak. We're called to delight in learning about the world and about the world's people as they are, rather than to run scared or to put our fingers in our ears and pretend it's not happening. We're called to be attentive to embodied reality, to seek to listen, to understand, and just maybe to find the Lord in the silence, just as Elijah did. For if we, however falteringly, seek to know and understand things as they really are, rather than as we might wish they were, then in time we might learn how to speak of them once again. If we become people known for paying attention, and not merely people who wish to hope things into existence, then we have a fighting chance of the world hearing when we then speak. And if in our speaking we end up reminding ourselves and even those around us that real human beings matter, then dare I say, we might have made just a little step on the road to who we are ultimately called to be entire, beloved, even holy, and human.
Let us pray. O oh God, who has dwelt with us in the very flesh of our human bodies, and yet dwells in glory in the clouds of heaven, assure us of the worth of our bodies and of everybody, female bodies, black bodies, disabled bodies, queer bodies. And also assure us of your promise that they will all be revealed in their full glory by your redeeming power. O oh God, bless all those preparing for the season of Lent. Lead us from the transitory things of this world so that we can pay attention to the fullness of its joy shown us by the incarnate Son. O oh God, the Prince of Peace, quiet in the nations that are in the tumult of warfare and unrest, make it known again that you are not to be found in wind, in earthquake or in fire, but in the moment when guns fall silent and we see you face to face in the faces of our fellow human beings. O oh God, strengthen your servants who suffer. Give them the provision that they need for their journeys, whether it be to restoration of health or to eternal joy in your presence. And let us gather all of our prayers, spoken and unspoken, by saying together the words of the grace the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost, be with us all, evermore. Amen. Thank you to Charlie for preaching for us, and for Francis, our ordinand, for leading us in prayer. Following the service, please do stay for a drink. If you're unsure about where to go, you go out of chapel and you turn left and then right and then in through the door where it says old lodgings. I'm not going to go in there. This coming week, um, this is Ash Wednesday on Wednesday, obviously. Um, at 6.15, there is a mass with the imposition of ashes. The choir will be singing birds mass for four voices and all are welcome. If you're a college member and would like to have a chat about Lent or indeed anything else, then please do be in touch. And we stand to sing our final hymn, which is number 334, All People That On Earth Do Dwell. <coughs> 